Welcome to the China Report with your host, Joshua Phillip. Welcome back, everyone. Today we have with us a great guest. We have Mark Ruskin. Some of you may have seen him before on our other shows with Epoch Times. Mark is a former FBI agent. He spent 27 years in the agency. He was an undercover agent. And Mark, it's real good having you on the show. It's great to be back. back on. We're going to be talking today about Chinese espionage and some of the ways the FBI has been countering them. But there's a bit more on Mark. He was also he's also an adjunct professor at the John Jay School of Criminal Justice. He was a former, at least now. An assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, and he's an author of the book *The Pretender*, about his time in the FBI and some of the cases he worked on. And it's an interesting book that we've talked about before on, I think, *Declassified*, another Epoch Times show, about the kind of different tiers of the FBI, how the guys on the ground and the guys in the offices tend to have a very different cultures. It's it's an interesting book. Um, again, Mark, real great having you on the show. Thank you very much. The book, as you're pointing out, in addition to being a uh, recounting my, some of the narratives, some of the cases I worked, it gives a uh, an insider's view of how things function within the FBI. And today, with all the attention that the bureau is getting, I think many in the audience might have an interest in having an idea of you know what goes on in the decision-making process as opposed to what's portrayed in the newspapers and on television, <laughs> which is always obviously not uh, consistent with reality or, or the truth. Yeah, great. So before we jump in, we're going to, again, talk about Chinese espionage and some of the ways the FBI tries to combat Chinese espionage and some of the cases you've worked on, at least what you can't talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, we want to give a quick update on the coronavirus for those of you tuning in. In New York City, there are now two, two new suspected cases. This would be in addition to the 12 confirmed across the United States. In Australia, there are now 15 cases confirmed. Uh, jumping in now, the CDC is sending test kits to all labs across the, or well, two labs across the United States. In Wuhan, China, they have made 11 new makeshift hospitals. These are basically warehouses, stadiums, gyms and just have beds stacked next to beds. There are some photographs coming out. People within these hospitals have been writing on the Chinese internet for help, saying they're in quarantine, they're on lockdown, that they don't have enough food, they don't have enough water. Some of these have you know, hundreds of people in maybe one bathroom, and so they're not in a good situation. 34 cities in China are on lockdown. White collar workers are working from home. Um, Getting into the People's Daily, one of the official mouthpieces of the Chinese Communist Party, they're now announcing that everyone in Wuhan needs to check their temperature and that the, what is it, the Chinese Communist Party vice premier is demanding that all people in Wuhan check their temperature and if they have any sign of illness, they need to check into a hospital. One of the issues they're having is the people testing everyone are not changing their suits from person to person. And there are people in Wuhan who are very concerned that they may be themselves uh, spreading the disease unintentionally. Now, we'll jump back into the uh, interview with Mark now. And again, Mark Ruskin is a former undercover FBI agent. He spent 27 years in the agency. And he's here to talk to us about Chinese espionage. So, Mark, why don't we start first talking about the difference in combating espionage between FBI and CIA? Because we, we know the Cold War stories, that there was overlap, and the, the agencies had to kind of reassess their boundaries and who was in charge of what. And what, what is the difference in terms of fighting espionage? Right, and uh, you know, I'd like to uh, make it clear, many of the points I make about espionage, or to a large extent, uh, are covering not all hostile powers who are trying to uh, uh, obtain information illegally or classify information from uh, within the United States. So while it applies to, to China, much of it would apply to Russia or to other uh, Central or South American hostile powers. There are a lot of hostile powers that direct their efforts for obvious reasons at obtaining classified information within the United States. And I think it's important for your viewers to uh, understand the uh, jurisdictions of the different agencies involved, as you're mentioning. So while many people think of the CIA as having total jurisdiction for all matters having to do with intelligence, it's actually 
primarily divided with, between two agencies. And then there are other agencies which have corollary or parallel type of roles. The two primary agencies being the CIA, whose task essentially is gathering intelligence overseas. So that would be obtaining classified information or information of a national security importance to the U.S. in other countries, you know, operating and functioning within other countries internationally, globally. What domestically, that the task of countering the intelligence activities of other countries, most of them hostile, but not necessarily all hostile, as we've learned from some of the leaks, is the responsibility primarily of the FBI. So the FBI is not exclusively a law enforcement organization. It, the way it was founded and developed is both, it's, it has worse two hats. And it is, or at the time, it wore two hats. One was the law enforcement side, solving bank robberies, kidnappings, organized crime. And the other was the counterintelligence side, fighting to uncover the intelligence gathering activities of uh, other countries within the borders of the United States. Well, and even going back, uh, World War II era, before you had the CIA, mm -hmm. FBI played a much broader yeah, role. Yeah, and it, 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 yeah. that's a good point. And I, I'll, I'll circle around to that in, in, in a moment. I, I would like to point out, uh, well f I'll, I'll mention that the, at the time of World War II, there was no CIA as most of us, uh, most of you, your uh, viewers will know. The, at the time, the OSS, which is the precursor to the CIA, had been formed. It was under the heading of, the, of Wild Bill Donovan, who was a kind of a legendary figure. Uh, and American uh, intelligence operatives were being used in Europe uh, to gather information to help in the war against the, the Nazis, basically, and the fascists. And that agency eventually developed into the CIA. Uh, since there was no U.S. foreign intelligence gathering service, at the time, the FBI was tasked in Latin America with that job. So FBI agents were actually working operationally overseas gathering intelligence which ceased uh, once the, uh, the CIA essentially assumed jurisdiction. One thing I'd like to point out, because I think it's significant, about the fact that we have two separate agencies and the fact that it's a bifurcated system, is that this is typical of a democratic society. If you look at countries which have a, a true functioning democracy, there's a concern that power be amalgamated in one agency, that one agency which would operate both globally to gather intelligence and domestically to count as a counterintelligence counterintelligence agency would have too much power. Which we can we can see, for example, uh, in the Chinese Ministry of State Security. Exactly, I was going to MSS. point out yeah. in totalitarian countries such as in China and also others such as in Soviet U or ancient Soviet Union now mm -hmm. Russia. It was one agency which would handle it because they're not, they weren't concerned about too much power. They, in fact, that's what they wanted is too much power, uh, not too much from their point of view, <laughs> but to be able to, to control the populace. But if you look at other democratic countries, in England, you have MI5 and MI6 th who have the parallel jurisdictions as the FBI and the CIA. In France, you have the DST domestically and the DGSE globally. In Israel, you have the Shin Bet domestically, and you have the Mossad operating internationally. So all these true democracies follow the same pattern of a bifurcated system. Interesting. Now, when we talk about espionage, a lot of times espionage is not how we imagine it from the movies. Um, so for those of you who don't know, my work at Epoch Times, I'm the senior investigative reporter, and since about 2008, one of my main focuses was investigating Chinese front operations in the U.S. And so I've written a lot about, for example, the United Front Work Department, uh, Overseas Chinese Affairs Office, Tongs, which are like the, uh, say, guild or overseas uh, community organizations that the Chinese intelligence agencies try to infiltrate triad, the Chinese mafia, student group, so on. And for those of you who've read, um, you know, our reporting for all these years, you probably know, but for those of you who don't, uh, 
Uh, a lot of the Chinese uh, intelligence operations work on what we call overt espionage, so things like the Confucius Institutes getting into the academics societies, uh, Chinese student and scholar associations, which are often funded and uh, directed by the consulates according to their own websites mm -hmm. a lot of times. And so I'm curious how the FBI deals with this kind of short of crime espionage, which a lot of these agencies carry out. Yeah, I, I think a good argument could be made that the majority of intelligence gathering activities by hostile powers is not illegal in that it doesn't involve spies in the sense of, of uh, espionage and, and uh, drop, drop boxes and secret meets and so forth. A lot of it has to do with simply accessing open source information or developing relationships with naive uh, and, and willing uh, cooperators. The open source uh, is the most obvious, uh, is so obvious that maybe one wouldn't think of it, but just the libraries. <laughs> uh, uh, we live in a, in a society where we have chosen to have a more open society and the price we pay is that there's a risk from a national security point of view. So it's a kind of a balancing act. Do we want a more open society or do we want to protect national security materials? Or is there a kind of a, a middle ground where, where we can uh, find a, a satisfactory solution? One uh, attempt to try and identify the exploitation of libraries was uh, back a, a long time ago in the Reagan era when there was an FBI initiative to work with librarians to identify, to identify individuals who were behaving in a kind of a suspect manner, and, and obviously suspect. If you have you know, someone with an accent, let's say, from a hostile or foreign power coming into the library on a regular basis and looking at scientific diagrams of a very abstract and high uh, academic level, which may very well, which would be unclassified, but are still of great significance, uh, that could be, would have been ideally something that could be reported back to the Bureau uh, by librarians who are well positioned to distinguish and who make a career of being in the library. They can <laughs> identify. The, se the secret life of librarians. Right. <laughs> spy, <laughs> spy hunters by night. So that was considered perhaps a, 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 an ideal way at least to initiate uh, identify potential uh, suspect behavior. The reaction was very negative from the librarians and very negative from civil libertarians to the point where it ultimately you know, uh, had to be shut down. It was reported in the New York Times and, 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 and there was a lot of publicity about it. But this would have been a, you know, perhaps an, an ideal. You know, following up on that, after 9-11, and the, the, it was the Patriot Act, which also uh, sought to uh, focus on, on libraries and other open sources for non-classified information with national security letters and gag orders. The, the reaction to that by the librarians, uh, which may or may not come as a surprise, was signs being posted in the libraries warning patrons uh, that their, their private uh, information gathering or, or browsing in the libraries could be subject to a government uh, oversight or, or, or da uh, uh, gathering of, th of their personal information. So I don't think that worked too well either, but it's another example of where the librarians uh, didn't, didn't react in a particularly cooperative manner perhaps thinking that the government was being overcautious or paranoid. Well, in, that's an interesting point because a, lo a lot of times the average person doesn't understand the significance of, say, other countries trying to exploit open sources or the, say, mal, mal intent of certain other countries. Now, I know, go, uh, you know, researching the history of Chinese espionage uh, just as an example, a lot of it did rely on open source technology. Actually, there's a really interesting story that's related to me by a source, geez, back in 2010 probably, uh, emphasizing, you know, that was around the time when 
Chinese cyber attacks were first starting to be announced. You had Operation Aurora, where these Chinese hackers had breached the uh, or tried to breach Google, the Gmail systems, and you know, pretty much cybersecurity went from being an, a niche kind of pseudo non-issue to a national discussion. Uh, one of the experts I talked to at that time was former NSA agent, actually, who had monitored Chinese communications during the Cold War. And he relayed to me a very interesting series of stories. So he said that basically, now, when he, he was comparing the way the Soviets operated when they were doing, say, reverse engineering compared to the way the Chinese operated doing re reverse engineering. And this emphasized, I think, the seriousness of uh, open source intelligence and also how the Chinese really um, made breakthroughs beyond what even the Soviets could have achieved using it. So his story went like this. <clears throat> now let's talk about a hypothetical case that, say, a satellite goes down with an advanced camera on it. Um, the Soviet Union would take that camera and they'd you know, assign their top scientists and their top lab to try to reverse engineer it. They'd spend a ridiculous amount of money trying to reverse engineer it from the top. Hmm. The Chinese Communist Party, on the other hand, knowing they were coming out of a pseudo-agrarian society, they were not technolog technologically advanced at the time, knew that they didn't have the capabilities to reverse engineer it from the top up. So they went from the bottom, or sorry, top down. So they went from the bottom up. And what they did was they looked at, okay, what are we capable of building using our own uh, currently existing technologies? Now let's look at the next generation because when you talk about technologies and stuff, there are generations of technologies. So let's say the camera they're trying to research is a 10th generation technology, they're a third generation. So they'd say, okay, let's go learn fourth and fifth. And so they'd have their students overseas go to libraries, get you know booklets on how cameras work and things like that, and they'd bring it back. Good and they'd, they'd learn to build four and five generation using open source. Then they'd have people get jobs with Nikon and other big, you know, I mean, hypothetically speaking, of course, camera companies and learn how to build generation six and seven. And when you get to generation six and seven, the gap between that mm -hmm. and 10 becomes much less. And really, they can, you know, look at the camera and say, okay, they changed this, this, and this, and they learn how to build those parts specifically. And the the speed at which the Chinese were able to advance technologically was something that even the Soviets were concerned about, according to my source at that time. And so, yeah, these days, of course, when we're dealing with Chinese academic espionage, it's, it's hitting front and center. We, there was recently the case of this Harvard professor who was found to be taking something like 50000 a month from China, the Chinese uh, regime without disclosing it. Texas A&M University just did a review and found over 100 faculty members were receiving money from China. There's been a backlash against the Chinese Confucius Institutes, where the Chinese Communist Party pays schools and universities to put these institutes in, and there's been concerns of well, cases of censorship. And you know, like I mentioned before, Chinese student and scholar associations, groups being used to pressure students, monitor students. This has been heavily exposed in Australia, funny enough, but not as much exposed in the U.S. And so just adding some uh, different, uh, you know, cases to your point. Yeah, academic espionage is a big deal, and a lot of it does target open source. I, uh, also, uh, following up on, on what you were uh, mentioning about your, your contact talk, uh, talking about the access to open source, maybe pre, uh, earlier generation information, Often the open source information, the technological uh, rep reviews or reports, contain information which is subject to being classified at a later date or has not yet been classified. So, and this is a, a, a also an important distinction: is that information is being published at times which has not yet been reviewed and which will ultimately be classified and no longer accessible in a legal manner. But by being really on top of things, uh, services like the, uh, the Chinese and, and the Russians and other hostile ones, the ones who are really uh, active, they can identify and, and, and obtain this information while it's still legal to do so. Uh, and then subsequently it may be classified, but at the time when it does eventually get reviewed and classified, it's too late. The doors, it's uh, shutting the barn door right after the uh, the animals have already escaped. Well, and this 
kind of leads into an interesting point, a point which is the issue of open systems, the exploitation of open systems, not just open mm-hmm. source information, but systems of government and, uh, I'd say, open societies, as mm-hmm. <laughs> like some people call it. Um, when we look at Soviet-era espionage, they talked about ideological subversion, which was based around exploiting open systems. In other words, you have borders which are fairly easy to get into, you have voting systems where everyone could, can participate, you have people with relative freedom within the society to get jobs and move up in ranks and legal protections to protect those freedoms. But when you're dealing with the Soviet era ideolog- systems of ideological subversion, they were looking at undermining institutions, infiltrating things, rendering institutions non-functional and putting their own agents in place in different institutions. When we look at the Chinese Communist Party today, they talk about str- the, the, the phrase is strangle you with your own systems, where they talk about doing the same thing. And they also talk about things like unrestricted warfare, which kind of carries the flag of Soviet-era ideological subversion. But the point in this being, by the nature of our system itself, having a relatively open society, um, there are countries that want to use forms of espionage that don't necessarily violate our laws, that, are, that work to exploit these systems to either undermine them or serve a foreign interest. Uh, I'm curious what, the, you know, maybe in your work, mm-hmm. what you've seen or, you know, what is being done to fight back against this. Well, you know, you know as I alluded to earlier, you know, we, you know, we have chosen to live in an open and democratic society. And, uh, and we all want to have civil liberties and to, and to uh, live as individuals and without uh, excessive government intervention in our day-to-day activities. So uh, in order to, uh, by doing that, we, ass- we make ourselves more vulnerable. And uh, I would argue that the, it's worth the price to be, to, because I think you, you would agree, most of us would agree that what, what makes the United States special in one uh, context is, it's, is the Constitution and, and, and our individual rights. So what we need to do is to have a heightened degree of caution in terms of, by creating these dangers, we have to create countermeasures to, uh, to uh, be assured that our own openness uh, which they would interpret, let's say, as a weakness, is in turn and, and used against us. And that's done by having a robust counterintelligence service, not just the FBI, but you also have a uh, defense intelligence agency and, and, and NSA, NSA and other agencies which are involved in, in, in fighting uh, the, uh, and, and, and um, co- uh, eliminating the, the efforts of, of hostile countries. And now, in the FBI, I think it's been very successful over the years through a variety of, of, of techniques uh, in to, to, uh, uh, to limit the, the damage by, uh, by, uh, that's done by the, these uh, very active intelligence services. Well, and it's interesting, too, that you know, there, there are two camps. It, it, it's, it's complicated because sometimes the people who become aware of what is being done by foreign powers become very concerned about it. I, I can sure. tell you my own research, understanding what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, it's, it's pretty dang concerning. Sure. <laughs> but at the same time, sometimes the methods that have been used to counter it become a bit too extreme themselves. I know that, uh, for example, McCarthyism, some people had a lot of issues with that, of course. Mm-hmm. They, um, maybe he, I think he did, understanding the nature of uh, Soviet subversion, ideological subversion, and the push for the global communist revolution, which was a thing at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, it had legitimate reasons for it, but of course people wouldn't go with it. And you mentioned, of course, these librarians. You know, right. they, they, it, it, we're a free country. People can choose to not go along with something right. if they don't like it. Uh, there's also what Leo, I think it was, correct? But they, well, they can choose not to go along with it. But uh, but also they don't need to go out of their way to sabotage it. You know, by putting up <laughs> yeah. signs in the library saying "Patrons <laughs> beware." Yeah. I mean, they, you know, <coughs> just. Uh, there's an irony here that it shouldn't be lost, is that you have, with academia in particular, and you mentioned you referred to the FBI's arrest last month of uh, Professor Lieber up at Harvard. There's an irony here in that you have uh, a kind of a, uh, you have in the, the 1970s radical leftists, 
have now evolved and matured into being the radical deans and professors of academia. So you have this very kind of left wing, I would suggest, oriented media, I mean academia, media also, but I'm talking now about, that. we're talking now about academia, which prevents, which provides, as uh, the special agent in charge of the FBI in Boston said, a target-rich environment, and an environment which is kind of sympathetic uh, to, uh, to uh, these uh, uh, countries which are uh, hardcore communist uh, totalitarian regimes. It, it, and it's an irony that they've developed thanks to the uh, democracy, but in this, we don't want to become the, opponent, the people that we're opposing. So uh, there's a kind of a, of a, a balancing act that I keep, I know I keep uh, getting back to, that, that we have to walk. It's a bit, a bit of a, a tightrope. Yeah, let, let's talk about some of the tools the FBI uses and that maybe you've seen applied when it comes to countering uh, foreign espionage. I think the first one we'll touch on is FISA. But the the uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, as I think a lot of people know now because of uh, recent uh, publicity, it's obtained as a result of uh, its misuse, arguably, uh, not arguably, its misuse <laughs> uh, in in the 2016 uh, presidential campaign. I mean, I think I think we could say it's not arguable because of the results of the Inspector General's report, Michael Horowitz concluded that there was a misuse of it. So the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act provides for uh, warrants which allow for the interception of communications with foreign nationals in cases where there's an, a national security involved. And it's an important tool to monitor potential activity, which is, and it's a great tool in terms of it allows us, it allows the uh, U.S. to, to intercept potentially hostile communications with and and to do so in a manner that's not doesn't involve us acting like them we have judges who are reviewing theoretically the warrant applications and it's not just law enforcement or intelli counterintelligence services which on their own initiative are intercepting the calls it's done with you know through a neutral magistrate now what's happened of course is that it appears that these were being used for intercepting communications by non-foreign uh, uh, actors in a context which was a political context. So as important a, a tool as it is, it's subject to abuse and is in need of reform. And uh, I, think, I don't think, uh, some legislators have argued for revoking the FISA Act, but I think that it's, it has too important a value to the U.S. Uh, from a strategic national security point of view to be revoked. I think it should be, there are man ways in, in which it can be uh, restructured to add more safeguards uh, to protect uh, Americans from, from, from that kind of abuse. I know you can't talk too much about cases, <laughs> mm. but um, are there any that have been maybe prosecuted already where you have personally used FISA and uh, worked out? Yeah, th th there aren't cases where Although I have to say, you know, as an undercover agent, you know, I was a tool for the for the case agent. So a case agent in, in an undercover operation would use me as a, as a tool, uh, just like they would use any other tool. Like they could, they may use uh, surveillance, they may use subpoenas, they may gather information through a bunch of other sources, and sending out an undercover agent to develop a relationship or to might be another way that the case is being worked. And as a you know, technique, let's say, it sounds better than a tool, but as a technique, I would not necessarily be aware of the other techniques being used by the agent in that investigation. You know, they may say, hey, Mark, we'd like you to do this. Go ahead and do it. See what you can find out. 
and at the same time they'd be using other investigative techniques to gather information. Yeah. And there's some great photos of Mark in his undercover get-ups. <laughs> yeah. But the... the, the uh, right, which I, I think you might have them in your book. I, it's probably, they probably can't see it. The uh, yeah. online, the, if you, they can see it when they Google me and uh, Google Mark Ruskin. Yeah. Bri briefly, why don't you tell us about... I, I know you infiltrated one of the crime families. Right? Well, I, um, if you want to talk... I mean, I, w relevant to espionage cases or to intelligence, uh, and I w the cases which I can talk about are essentially the ones which are in the book because they were reviewed by the FBI and I was authorized by the Bureau to, 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 to publish them. So the procedure, anyone, uh, any for employee, whether it's from the FBI or, or another intelligence-related type agency, if you're going to be publishing a book, you have to submit it for pre-publication review. And so everything that's in the pretender was authorized by the Bureau. But it includes a chapter on false flag operations. Hmm. And yeah. I worked in them. And, and, and it's funny because uh, a lot of people argue false, false flags don't exist. But, uh, of course, it's a, it's a valuable tool when it comes to you guys, right? Right. Well, well the, the way it, w it would work would be, say that s a, a, an American... It could be an engineer, let's say, working at a nuclear plant or a nuclear research laboratory or a military officer with access to classified information w would reach out w looking to sell classified information to a foreign power, a host n normally a hostile foreign power, but not necessarily. And the uh, FBI would learn somehow, sometimes through an informant or different... Uh, that, you know, let's say the, uh, the uh, future trader or the potential uh, trader approaches someone and says, do you know anybody in X, Y, Z country which would be interested in this material I have or this knowledge I have? So the informant could say, well, sure, I, 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 I know I have some contacts overseas. Uh, I'll put them in touch with you. And instead, now the informant goes to the FBI and says, hey, you know, John Smith is looking to sell information to X, Y, Z country. So then the espionage unit at headquarters would reach out to me. And at this point, I was kind of a senior undercover, uh, what they call, we call an eminence grise, you know, someone who's been around for a while, because these cases were very sensitive in, the, in, in that they were very important because they involved major breaches of national security, and the opportunities to exploit was very limited. Because if I couldn't, I would contact this individual posing as an intelligence officer from another country. And that's where the false flag term comes in. I was operating with a false flag. So I would approach, but generally, if the initial approach wasn't convincing, that was it. The person would disappear, would clam up, and wouldn't, the case would be done. So it had to be so persuasive that at the first meeting, the individual was, you know, would sink, uh, you know, would swallow the, the hook uh, completely, and then we would evolve a relationship where the individual and develop a method for them to provide me with the information, uh, and a very, using a lot of uh, spy Jean Le Carré type of uh, tradecraft, you know, drop boxes, and where the individual would leave information for me in a Dropbox, and I would pick it up and so forth. Like, like holes in trees and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, well, <laughs> with the kind of stuff that you see in, in the novels. Yeah. But it, invariably, uh, with one or two exceptions, it worked. <laughs> and uh, I would develop a relationship, you know, me, the senior intelligence officer, and, and the, uh, the spy, uh, uh, the trader, Providing classified information up to the so up to when the uh, Justice Department and the uh, uh, Bureau management w would decide that and there was enough, and then uh, then the person would be arrested and, uh, of course, subject to you know to some serious uh, penalties. What, what what other kinds of operations did you carry out like this? Well, another one. I mean, th I think I was fortunate in that my career I was able to span the whole array of criminal behavior, which was uh, organized crime, narcotics trafficking, white collar crime, mm -hmm. and then uh, later in my career, uh, counterintelligence cases. Uh, so in, in one case, we worked with what's called a dangle, which is another tool that's used uh, in counterintelligence in operations, in which 
uh, a potential trader is dangled for an intelligence server. So I was I developed a relationship with someone that was known to be an intelligence officer from a, from a hostile power. I won't identify you know which one. And over, I mean, for the first six months, I never even talked to this individual hardly, other than to say hi and bye. Up until the point where we, and for, and for these kind of operations, it's like a chess game. It's, and that's what makes it different from a criminal case, which is more immediate, let's say. This is a, a long-term uh, game where one has to have a lot of patience, where we waited for this individual to approach me. And, in, and start to develop a relationship with me, seeing me as a potential individual who could be recruited. And I would have lunch with him or her uh, w once a month. And they, they thought they were recruiting as a double agent. Then. Right, and exactly. <laughs> yeah. they, well, they thought, yeah. they, they were exactly, they were gonna, they were gonna re and that when we'd have lunch, I would complain to him, to him or her that, uh, I felt I wasn't paid enough for, for my job, or my supervisor didn't recognize my qualities, <laughs> that I was being overlooked for promotion. Uh, all these things were, I was trying to make them believe that uh, these were potential weaknesses that they could exploit, mm -hmm. so that by uh, ultimately they could say, you know, start at tasking me and, and offering, you know, praising me and, and, and offering uh, me money, afterwards until they had me snared, and then they would, have what they thought was a great source for confident classified information, but really what they had, that unknowingly what they would have had is a double agent, an FBI agent providing them with carefully tailored information that we would want them to, that we wanted them to have. Uh, and th when I worked this case, I, th I was thinking this is, not, this is great, I, I've now worked everything. And I discussed it in, in the book, it, this case came to an unfortunate conclusion which had nothing to do with the uh, case itself, but I was involved in a very terrible motorcycle accident which pulled, took me out of service for, for four months. And uh, as with most types of cases, but especially true with any type of undercover operation, uh, you know, t t time is, is like in, you know, in real estate, you say location is everything, and undercover ops, timing is everything. And uh, for me to disappear for four months, that was the end of, of that case, but it, it certainly was a, an interesting well, one. And I know there were some specific cases uh, we had discussed before that I wanted to talk about. The one was, I think, Bukar, was it? The, which one, the uh, Blue Score or? Yeah, that, that's the one, yeah. That, that's a police corruption case. I want to mention though, b b before I forget, that another technique that's been used, you know, in my case, I was being approached, uh, I was a, really an FBI agent, not a, a trader, but we have had cases where FBI agents were recruited and they were recruited for real. They weren't dangles. They were real FBI agents mm -hmm. who, who <coughs> betrayed their trust. The first one was not with the Chinese. It was uh, Richard Miller back uh, over 20, 30 years ago was recruited by the Soviets. And, and, and he was recruited through a, total, through a classical uh, method that you're f familiar with, I know, as a honey trap. It was a, 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 an attractive female Russian agent. Yeah, so in, just on that note, the Chinese Communist Party uses that very heavily. Th they, that they identify moral flaws in an individual for targeting, so lust, money, power, fame. Right, right. Okay. And, and the so. Soviets had a saying, there was a former Russian spy who came out and gave an interview a long time ago, I can't remember which media it was, and she said, you know, the concept's very simple. In the West, you've asked your men to stand up for their country, in Russia, we asked the women to lay down for their country. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, again, in these kinds of societies, they're able to do that. I, I, I don't think that that would be viewed very well. I'm, I'm sure. In, in, in <laughs> for us, in our society, to be sending out young female FBI and CIA operatives and having them uh, do anything uh, like that would be horrible. Of course. Uh, it would be unthinkable but they do it as a matter of course. And more to the point here is uh, James, uh, I think James, what's his name? James, uh, it'll come to me in a second, uh, 
the, was an FBI supervisor who uh, spent 20 years with a female a Chinese uh, spy, basically. The uh, Chung was her name, Katrina Chung. And so here's a case where the honey trap was used for two decades before uh, he was finally caught and, and ended up with a, with a plea arrangement. But so the, the, it's, it's a successful method of, of, of uh, recruiting potential sp uh, and traders. And it's, it w I can tell you, uh, researching Chinese uh, espionage operations, it's extremely common. Um, and it's easy to do. I mean, imagine if, if you're a Chinese intelligence agency and you want to, say, uh, infiltrate a major U.S. corporation mm -hmm. and you want to gain access, for example, to their server networks like that, you just, you just go on LinkedIn, type in the company name, map their entire employment structure, find the... Uh, mm -hmm. Their their nerdy you know computer network engineer guys and right, send right. a pretty you know Chinese girl to go ask him out or, you know talk to him and it's as it's simple as that unfortunately and uh, extremely common as well. Well, we have I mean he, we had a situation right where the uh, the mistress of uh, of you know, we're talking about back in the sixties of a, uh, a major mafia boss I think it was Jack Hona Sam was uh, at the same time the mistress of the President of the United States, allegedly. So it's, it's, it's as old as time, uh, Mada Hari. I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but you're right. It, 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 there are situations here where it's been used uh, both by the Soviets and by the Chinese successfully to penetrate American intelligence services. Now, just on a couple of these cases we discussed before, what was it, Blue Car, was it? Well, Blue Score, was a poli was a police corruption case. I see. The, uh, the I mean, it was a fascinating case, and 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 uh, and, uh, and I worked a number of of, of crim long term criminal undercover operations like that. But but uh, you know, if specifically to today, you know, if you want, we, I can focus on the uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe for a future episode, we'll get into some of the other ones. Just better plan with it. And any any particular ones involving foreign espionage you can talk about? Right? Well, I think I think m essentially the false flag cases are the ones which are the most interesting ones, and the ones which, since you know what the issue is in terms of what one can talk about as a as a former uh, individual who, who held the uh, classification, you know, was able to access classified information is that what is permitted to be talked about is what is in the public record. I see. So, so, you, so your book. And well, <laughs> well, well, also, in, in, in an espionage case, yeah. ultimately ends up as a criminal case. Yes. And, and much of the information ends up in, in front of a judge uh, as part of a plea agreement, ends up, so it ends up becoming declassified. It, in well, the maybe, majority maybe of Maybe we could talk about some specific cases, and I know that... Um, Th there are, like we mentioned before, that a lot of espionage is made to exploit open systems. Uh, part mm -hmm. of that, everyone, I mean, by now everyone's heard rumors of foreign countries trying to interfere with our elections and so on. Yes, there's the uh, Russian Internet Research Agency, Chinese Communist Party has a whole department, military department focused on political warfare, and the general political department, mm -hmm. uh, which has recently been restructured. Um, but when we talk about things like, you know, Chinese money in the elections, for example, I know there have been some cases of this. Well, I think yes. one doesn't have to look very far back. I mean, it, it, and again, here's another example of the irony of history and how politics can influence one's uh, uh, subjective interpretation of a series of events. And, and when I say one, I'm talking about uh, p specific media and political uh, individuals, individuals in, in, in political circles, I should say, is it, you know, today we look at the accusations made against uh, you know, the Trump campaign alleging that the uh, Russians influenced the, uh, the elections. Now, I'm, I'm sure the Russians tried to influence the elections because they've, they've been doing that since the creation of the Soviet Union. I mean, I, I know you and I have both read biographies, or autobiographies, rather, of former KGB officers who were stationed in New York back in the 50s and 60s. They described their 
blow by blow their uh, efforts to uh, influence the elections. So it's, it would be naive to think that they had stopped at any point. And, and for politicians today to be saying, oh my, the, the Russians are trying to influence our elections like it's a surprise would be uh, uh, a little hypocritical. The, uh, it's, but as far as the Chinese, you go back to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Clinton re-election campaign and you have uh, with Johnny Chung, uh, and there were, there were t 22 convictions, so this is public record as well, involving money from China being donated to the Clinton campaign and to the Democratic National Committee. I, mean, you, I remember at, at, at the time reading of gardeners who had reportedly donated $5,000 to the campaign. Now, uh, I, I, no matter how, how uh, altruistic this Chinese gardener might be, uh, to think that a, a gardener is going to, who's making, what, $5 an hour or $7 an hour, uh, is going to be donating $5,000 to, to the campaign of his or her own money, I think uh, uh, stretches credulity a little bit. So, but at the time, was there general outrage over foreign interven intervention in, in American politics? No, there wasn't. In fact, uh, most of the media ridiculed uh, individuals who were trying to uh, shed light on what was going on. Mm -hmm. The same who ridiculed uh, are the same ones who today are, uh, are accusing the uh, Russians of doing the same thing. Now, uh, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You know, it was bad then, uh, it's bad now, but, uh, but it's certainly uh, a good example of, uh, of what you're talking about. Uh, Mark, just as a last question, I, I guess, what would you say the, how big is the threat of foreign espionage? And uh, at least according to my, well, you know, what I see, it seems China is the biggest threat when it comes to this. Uh, for, I guess, first of all, do you agree or disagree with me? And second, um, you know, how big is the problem? What's being done about it? Do you think it's enough being done about it? The, 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 I, I, I would, you know, in closing, I would mention, you know, my expertise is not such that I can tell you this country or that country is, is the bigger threat. I mean, I can point to what Special Agent in Charge Bonaventura said last month, where he, in a press release, stated that China is the largest, is the biggest count, uh, uh, threat from an intelligence point of view to the United States. So, uh, so taking what he is saying as verbatim, uh, as, as the truth, you know, I would rely on that. But from my own uh, knowledge, is China more dangerous than Russia? You know, and I would say, does it matter? I mean, they're both dangerous as are, are the other hostile. I mean, they're not the only, I would suggest, I doubt that they're not the only hostiles involved. And uh, you have smaller services from other, you know, uh, communist regimes, be they uh, in Asia or, or in South or Central America, that are also players. So the threat posed by hostile uh, intelligence services is certainly a significant one. And, and just, and, one that we cannot let our guard down on. The tr trick is to continue fighting them effectively while at the same time maintaining our civil liberties. And I, I think it can be done you know, by judicious uh, application uh, of you know, the appropriate legislation and empowering the agencies to do it in a, in a responsible uh, and ethical manner. Thank you. So Mark Ruskin again, real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks, it's been great to be here. Thanks, John. For those uh, tuning in, Mark Ruskin is a former FBI agent. He spent 27 years in the agency. He was an undercover agent. Uh, he is also the author of the book, The Pretender, which uh, is called My Life Undercover for the FBI, which talks about some of his cases and also the different, say, cultures between the field agents and those in charge of the FBI, which is pretty interesting, especially given the current political situation now and some issues which don't have time to go into. <laughs> but Mark, love to get you on again sometime. Great. Thanks a lot, yeah. Josh. Great. And everyone, please remember to like and subscribe. If you're on uh, YouTube, click the notification bell. You get updates when the videos are published.
Uh, please tune in also. We're again Monday through Friday, starting around 10 a.m. every day. We'll get more to the T with starting at 10 a.m. soon, hopefully. <laughs> Sorry about that. And with that said, we'll see you all next time.